Well, today uh, we're turning to another different psalm, Psalm 84, the Sons of Korah. We spent uh, three days in Psalm 42, 43, and actually could revisit it through the rest of this week. Uh, so I just want to pause and thank the Lord for a scripture that's just so rich and full, and there's never enough time to do it justice. Thank you, Lord, so much for Psalm 42, 43, and the treasures you have for us there that we explored a bit. And we're just so grateful for how you use your word, uh, its authority in our lives to instruct us. And even now, as we come to another psalm, uh, we want to take note of it and let it speak to us. So we invite your Holy Spirit to do that and teach us. In the name of Jesus, amen. So this is another of the Psalms of Korah, as you see, Psalm 84. There are 12 of them in the Psalms, the Psalter, the Hebrew hymn book, uh, 42 to 49. And then Psalm 84 and 85 and 87 and 88. Those 12 make up the ones written by the sons of Korah. So I'd like us, like we have done, to let this embed in our spirits by reading it together. So let's uh, just read it uh, in unison together from the very beginning. Psalm 84, for the choir director on the Gittith, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Selah. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. <clears throat> I don't think it's really possible for ardent music students to read or hear Psalm 84 without thinking of Brahms. Particularly, of course, his German Requiem in which the fourth movement takes the opening verses of this psalm and turns them uh, good as they are in poetic form, turns them into a choral marvel and masterpiece. How lovely are thy dwelling places, O Lord of hosts, the fourth movement of Brahms' German Requiem. Robert Schumann, you might know, such an intimate friend of Johannes Brahms, said with reference to the music of Brahms, we stand in the wonderful view of the spiritual world when you work with Brahms music. I had the great joy in my uh, music training myself, first at the uh, New England Conservatory and then at Wheaton College where I finished up at Wheaton. Uh, we did the German Requiem of Brahms and uh, for some reason, 
I was chosen to sing the baritone solos, standing side by side with somebody who became a real, one of the top sopranos in the world, uh, Sylvia McNair. And uh, we were good friends, and uh, she far outshone me. I just uh, kind of lived my life in her shadow. <laughs> But it was a great joy, and she was just one of the most effortless, most effortless singers I've ever met. She, and she, she came to Wheaton not as a voice student. She started on violin. She's actually an excellent violinist as well, and a pianist. But then voice took over. Such a history, both Brahmsian and the impact of this, the most widely known of his choral works, I'm sure, on me personally, should only invigorate us to want to know this Psalm 84 in more depth exegetically and theologically. I want to suggest that there are two critical similarities between this Psalm and the Psalms of the Sons of Korah and Psalm 42, 43 that we examined, we looked at in depth in the previous days. It is, first of all, similarly, one of the Psalms of pilgrimage that reflect either a people in exile longing to worship in Jerusalem or a person so committed to worshiping the Lord that they are actually en route to the temple in Jerusalem. Their faithfulness, their obedience compels them. They must go. In either case, it is indicative of the type of person or a communal group, of course, whose faith can be defined by the word pilgrimage, an active, moving, growing, anti-stoic, anti-static kind of faith. And I want to urge you that something is very wrong if your faith deteriorates into something stuck, something static, something perfunctory, rather than moving, always in movement. Let your understanding of music and its movement, it has to move somewhere to be effective. Similarly, that's good theology, that's good faith, it's moving, it's growing, it's active. Rather that a person whose verb and vibrancy is not at all stuck but is defined and exemplified in their ardor for the worship of God. The other similarity that this psalm, exactly like Psalm 42-43, is that it gives special attention to the God who is uniquely the living God. Do you see that in verse 2? My soul longed, even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My flesh, my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. This phrase, the living God, in all of the Psalter, the Hebrew hymn book, the Psalms, only appears in these two places, clearly, therefore, coined by these wonderful sons of Korah. In heaven, I'm going to seek them out, get to know them. I'll make more specific references to this idea of the living God, again, that the sons of Korah give emphasis to in just a few moments. Now, though the exegetical and theological contours of this psalm are really quite demanding, its structure is actually quite simple and will guide us in how we can delve into this psalm and its wonderful truths, at least to get started today and finish up tomorrow. It is structured around two vocatives, and a prayer at the end. That's all it is, two vocatives and a closing prayer. Now, I would be pretty certain that a prayer, I think, is self-explanatory, but the importance of a vocative probably 
needs a little bit of explanation. Anybody know what evocative is? It's a grammar term and it's very important in Hebrew. Vocative. Evocative in grammatical terms is more a le or less a declarative exclamation. Oh my! Is evocative. And in Hebrew grammar, particularly, it is emphatically a declaration with a note of exclaim, a note of wonder, a note of wow, what is that kind of sense. And we see two of them, the two of them in this psalm. First, in verse 1, the exclamation, how lovely, how lovely. And the second comes in verse 5, how blessed. Now you'll read in there some other hows, but they're actually different Hebrew words. An exclamation, both of these, vocatives declaring with a note of exclamation, both are governed by the vocative mach in Hebrew, how lovely, how blessed. An exclamation of wonder and delight with a clear tone of comparison, isn't there? Thus it is conveying in this declarative sense, what compares with this? How lovely, how blessed, such and such a person. And so we look now at the first of these, declarations, exclamations, vocatives, how lovely are thy dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. Brahms must have known a little bit of theology, although his faith history kind of came and went. <laughs> how lovely, yadid, it's the Hebrew word lovely, well, certainly, by the way, and of course in Scotland and the UK, lovely is a term you hear all the time. Oh, that's a lovely cup of tea. That was a lovely afternoon. Right, Aiden? <laughs> Except from your friends, they use other language. <laughs> it's certainly lovely is certainly adjectival here, something lovely, descriptive. But it is more than that in Hebrew, yadid actually expressing a relationship of love. Something that is lovely is a relationship, a relational connection of love. So that lovely, as it is related here to thy dwelling places, is invoking particularly the relational beauty of temple worship. And thus is actually a comparison, as a vocative is, how lovely, of good worship. A comparison of good worship. This first vocative, in other words, seeks to define what good worship actually is is. There is to be, sure, I want you to think about this as Levitical Korahite priests of music. There is to be sure a qualitative aspect to our approaches to worship. There is, that is to say, good worship. There is also not so good worship or simply not good worship, or poor worship, or bad <laughs> worship. And there is good, God-honoring, excellent worship. Yes, of course, we have to take into consider vastly differing styles and cultural affinities that affect worship. 
some of the worship that I get the most out of today in the upper room. If you came along, you would say, what was that? But the spirit is in it because the hearts are full and it's Farsi and sometimes Arabic. And some of the best worship times I've experienced have been in the most culturally diverse of places. Uh, I had the great joy of doing my PhD work in African-American theology and black worship sometimes is just the most potent. I love it. And so we take into account vastly different cultures and styles, but still those can be assessed qualitatively according to differing cultural sensitivities of what might be good or poor or even bad. As we mentioned, these sons of Korda encourage worship that is defined as good when it is focused on the living God. Verse 2, my heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. That phrase, the living God, can equally rightly be translated God of life. The living God, God of life. That's probably its main emphasis supported by the reference in verse 3. Look at verse 3 very carefully. To the temple place of worship where even the bird lives, a swallow who produces young, who lays her eggs, that is, produces life. Even the temple draws creation. The birds find a nest up in the rafters and little ones start chirping. It's the poetic imagery there. The God of life. Good worship focuses on the living God or the God of life. It recalls for me what the wonderful Anglican New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, he's an incredible man. I've had a wonderful occasion to meet up with him one-on-one -on, -one on two or three occasions to talk about Scripture. And N.T. Wright suggests, and I agree with him absolutely, that you become what you worship. You become what you worship. It's in a wonderful little book of his titled Finding God in the Psalms. Page 27, to be exact. You become what you worship. Think about that today. What are you becoming? What are you focusing on? What are you giving your best allegiance to? What are you worshiping? So that one of the ways to assess good worship in accord with Hebraic cultural sensitivities is, are you more and more becoming a person who both demonstrates and embraces life? the God of life, with all its fullness, all its richness, including its sorrows, its struggles, its sufferings, as well as its joys and all of its curiosities, because you become what you worship. And if you are a worshiper of the living God, the God of life, you will be more and more a person, a human being who is fully alive. Not squelched, not half dead, not stoic, but fully embracing life. When I think of somebody like this, gladly I can tell you the first example that comes to mind is my daughter Heather. Perhaps Aiden could affirm this. She's our oldest. We have five children. Aiden's the youngest. Heather 
is 28 years old and has five children of her own. She married a wonderful African guy named Carlo from Congo, where I grew up. We had discovered we grew up just a few hours apart. He and Kisunjani and me in this little village called Wembo Nyama. And so her kids, we call the Carmel kids because they're white and black mixed. And Heather just, she had every reason to kind of be squelched by the hardships of life, but she just turned that as she returned to Jesus into life embracing. And she, Carlo is an artist, he's an animator for a company that makes videos and adverts and stuff like that, and he animates. So he works hard, but she, with five children, just embraces life in Glasgow. She takes them all over, five children, no car, on buses, trains, the very occasional taxi. She takes them to museums, to concerts, to food bazaars. She's the kind of person that when we have a gathering party, I make sure she comes because she just brings such life. Her vivacity. Is that a word? Vivacity? Yeah, I like it. <laughs> she says, Following Jesus makes me a person who embraces life rather than shrinking from it. Irenaeus, the bishop of Lyon in the second century, second century, that's like one, about 130 AD, he said this, the glory of God is a man fully alive. And I think this is what music does. This is why the Korahites would have such a thing. They're such musical priests. Music as a unique gift from God, it reminds us, it helps us. In a sense, it forces us, makes us, reminds us of what it is to be fully alive, fully human. It, music, offers a transcendent word and urges us to aspire to the living God, to the God of life. But, and this is a really important other side of the story, but, of course, the Hebrew sense that is without doubt given very serious attention in a phrase like the living God is also a negative assessment that is in Hebrew a prohibition against dead gods. That is the human tendency toward idolatry, to making something dead rather than embrace the real, true, alive, active, involved, living God. This is the underlying and prevailing sin in the Bible. That is the human proclivity to allow other things to usurp the place of God in our lives, in our culture, in our world. There are the opposite sides of the spectrum to aspire through worship and life to the living God as opposed to dead gods, idolatry. The opposite side of the far side of the spectrum of the other end of worshiping the living God according to biblical theology, the opposite of that is idolatry. And so young men and women and staff and faculty, and counselors, all of us, I want to say to you, as I say to myself today, as unequivocally as possible, that in the scripture, good worship, qualitatively good, excellent worship, always and invariably confronts 
the idols in your life. One of the reasons worship is so important to the sons of Korah and to you and me is because it constantly will put in our face the dead gods that we replace for the living God. Please let that sink in. Qualitatively good, healthy, excellent worship confronts your idols. Today, as you go through your day with a worshipful attitude, it will confront what are the idols that are vying for God what are the things that are vying for your best, your attention, your allegiance, your love, your devotion? And so I have to, on this Thursday, fourth day of our week together, I'm constrained by this text in particular, and really the biblical text in general, to conclude this morning by asking you and me some hard questions. Are you giving your attention and allegiance to things other than the living God? Are you giving your best to dead idolatry, to dead things rather than the God of life? What have you allowed to usurp the place of, the priority for, the authority of, and most importantly, the love of God, the living God in your life? Is it perhaps an important and endearing relationship? that is not dead, it's very alive, but it has usurped the place of God? Is it some goal or some bar of achievement? Is it some person's or institution's approval of you? Could you be at a place like Chehi and just crave the approval in such a way that it replaces the importance of God's approval of you? I struggled with that when I was a student here. I still struggle with it today. I compare myself to these incredible people around me and I need their approval that I'm okay, I'm good. And that can easily usurp God. Artists are so prone to that, the comparison. And I plead with you, you can't do that if you're worshiping the living God. It becomes dead very quick. Very quickly it turns into sucking life rather than giving life, doesn't it? Today, in these moments, examine yourself. What have you allowed, perhaps, to usurp the place of, the priority for, the authority of, and particularly the love of God, the living God? Is it even music that has become that to you? So I'd like us to conclude just now with a time of silence silent reflection, silent prayer, and ask you to say to the Holy Spirit, speak to me, show me any idolatries in my life. Speak to me, and then please be bold before the Lord right here today, not in front of me or anyone, but in the quietness of your heart to confess that to God. And it might help to meet with somebody 
one of your counselors, your teachers, myself, if that would be helpful, to confess. James says that confession brings healing. So just a few moments of quiet reflection and silent examination, then we'll conclude. <coughs> Amen. Good worship is necessarily Godward, God focused on the living God. And so good worship is assessed by how it invariably challenges your idols and my idols. Jesus, take us this day and help us to worship you, keep you, the living God, our highest allegiance and loyalty and devotion and love. Show us those things that usurp your place so that we can confess them and knock down those idols and serve the living God in the name of Jesus. Amen.